Hello everybody and welcome back to Military Aviation History. I'm your host Bismarck and this is Bernhard from Military History Visualized. I have a comment here. It's not really a comment specifically that was picked up by me, but there are many comments that I sometimes see uh, where people compare certain weapons platforms on my channel, it's going to be aircraft, with others. And I think this merits a discussion because sometimes these these, this, these comparison actually focus on aspects where I'm just like, you cannot compare these two aircraft or these two tanks in such a way. The specific one that I have here is the old dis discussion of uh, comparing the Spitfire, the British uh, Supermarine Spitfire, with North American P-51 Mustang from, of course, the Americans. These two birds, of course, iconic aircraft. Both Sp magnificent yeah, in their performance. Um, but... The aircraft in question, however, have a very different role. The Spitfire, when it was built, it had sort of the same design aspect, you could say, as the BF-109. So endurance is roughly the same, speed is roughly the same, performance stats are roughly the same, of course, give and take, as always. But what it is, it is an aircraft that goes fast, it gets to altitude quickly, does its job there, has limited range, lands, rinse and repeat. It's a, some people might call it an aerodrome defense, maybe point defense. It's simply an interceptor meant to engage enemy bombers, engage enemy air fleets, or to fight for local air superiority and wrestle with the enemy and establish air superiority in a given area located and you know, limited by time and space. Same thing with the BF-109. And you see these aircraft coming into their own, depending on their strengths and weaknesses, during the Second World War. The P-51 performance stats, speed and so on, might be very similar, but the endurance is completely different because it was, in a sense, um, it became an escort, a long-range escort fighter. So by saying just, oh, the P-51 is better because it has an endurance of a couple of hours versus a Spitfire, which can do an hour to an hour and a half. Of course, drop tanks are a thing. That's just you know, push that to a side, just similar clean uh, endurance of the aircraft is something that you really cannot compare these aircrafts to. And this is one of the things that I often see is you pick and choose the certain elements that prove your point because you prefer a certain aircraft. And I think with tanks um, or any other topic that is outside the realm of aviation, you would have sort of the same discussions going on. Yeah, so basically, I mean, with tanks, it's usually also what tank you compare with which one. Yeah. For instance, I compared the Panzer IV with the Sherman. But most often, what the both tanks were basically, I mean, the, the Panzer IV was from 1939 to 1945 in service. Right. Whereas the Sherman entered service basically uh, around late 1942, early 1943 or something and changed tremendously both tanks over the war. So I actually, I think I spent one hour or something determining which versions I actually compare. And I, I think I compared the, I actually don't remember which variant of the mm -hmm. Panzer IV I compared. I took the early M4 or a M4A1 mm -hmm. because I forgot already, because I know the a a A2 from the Sherman is like the diesel version which was, I think, only used by the Marines. So it's, it's getting already complicated. And look at the video where I exactly explain why, which compare. And with planes, you have this, uh, the same issue. I mean, you have the G6, the G10, you have the, the Friedrich, the Kurfürst, you have all the other planes. And I see yeah. for the P-51, I'm not sure if the variation is that large. I might be wrong there. I don't think so. I mean, there's But for the Spitfire, I know it's pretty insane yeah. from the Spitfire 1 to, to the late ones. The the other thing is, there are certain f engagements, perhaps, where you can say, okay, one side had this plane, the other side had this plane. In, provided in the context of the engagement, yeah. what were the strengths and weaknesses of these aircraft? Yeah, it makes there sense. There you have a discussion. So I, a long time ago, it's still one of my most popular videos out there, is the A6M2 versus the F4F Wildcat. And the reason why I did that is because, well, this was the matchup essentially in 1941, 1942. These two aircraft were going head to head. And you can look at, you can't, you can say the Zero is good at this thing. Yeah, long range endurance. It has 
relatively good firepower, it's extremely agile and so on. And then you have the F4F Wildcat, which has other strengths, but both of these have weaknesses. Let's compare them and how, it, you know, how things transform in that environment. But if you just pick and choose and say, well, the Zero was rubbish because it had no armor protection. Well, first of all, the F4F Wildcat did also not have armor protection until they introduced it which they essentially did uh, just after Pearl Harbor in most cases. I mean, this was the first uh, armor introductions for the F4F Wildcat were actually sort of ad hoc done by the uh, VF squadrons. But, you know, then you can say, oh, well, the F4F is very stable, we built, it's rugged. Yeah, that's the word that everybody uses. And it, it doesn't fall apart when you hit it. Well, yeah, that's one aspect. Then again, the Zero is extremely agile. It has ex extremely good range. Um, the crews, of course, how do the crews use the vehicle in question? Yeah, I mean, the, this is a, this a, a main completely issue. other thing. And that's, that, again, goes also in this, this aspect of comparing uh, aircraft or tanks even by kill rates and then not looking at the time and space when these happened. So the, uh, the kill rates of the, the Luftwaffe in certain in scenarios in certain uh, countries and in certain uh, theaters and in certain times are going to be very different between them. That doesn't mean that the opposition was better, it could have been, but it could also mean that the Luftwaffe, their capabilities were completely different, their pilots were completely different. And so the logistical so system yeah. and everything. Yeah. So sometimes when you see these comparisons, especially on the internet and sometimes on blogs and so on, they go into very good detail and I love it. And sometimes the, the the, uh, the comparisons make absolutely no yeah. sense. So I had uh, a B of 110, I saw a blog post one, B of 110 C4, yeah? So very early B of 110 compared with a late war P38. Yeah, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. So generally I would say if, if you see a comparison, make sure that they get the context right and yeah. they set the context. For instance, a as you mentioned, you can compare them in a specific scenario where they fought each other. Yeah. I compared, or you compare them like on a technical merits. I usually compare my tanks on a technical and tactical level. Mm -hmm. I leave out the operational and I leave out the strategic one. For instance, Saloga, when he looks at the tanks in his book, Armored Thunder, no, Armored Champion, he includes crew training. I completely disregard crew training because it has nothing to do with the tank. If they have trained crews or not doesn't make the technical thing different. There's ergonomics which are important for the crew mm. to use and which is something I look at. Mm. But crew training I don't think has some merit there. But others argue differently. Then I usually compared like I, I compared the Panzer III with the with the T-34. So basically the T-34 the, the early one and the Panzer III it was the one with the M. No, 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 that was yeah. still, um, I, it was not, I think I took the, the one with the 37 millimeters. Oh, so right, it yeah. was, I forgot again the, the, the J. The, no, I don't know. I answer. think a bit for J. Yeah. Huh. So, but for instance, I did also compare on my second channel, the Panzer 4 F, I think with the S 35, mm. whereas for instance, another YouTuber mentioned interesting choice because the S 35 is more similar to the Panzer 3. But what I went for is, I, in that case, I took what I thought was the best German tank versus the best French tank at this point. So, whereas because the Panzer IV was more a support tank at that point, mm. and the S-35 was the cavalry tank. Mm. So, could also make sense, but I qualified this. So, usually look in the video or the article or whatever, and why did they choose certain factors? Why they disregarded yeah. them? And if this discussion is not included, it's usually problematic because the context usually makes all the difference. Yeah. For instance, I didn't in the Panzer IV versus Sherman video, I didn't include the reliability thing because we are not quite sure how was this due to the tank being more reliable or the US Logistical systems being so much better because they produced, from what we know, way more spare parts for the tanks than did the Germans yeah. and most other countries. So once that question is actually settled, and I don't think it is from current research, we, I looked a bit into this, but there, there are two or three books on German tank repair, but still the numbers and everything, and also there's some in the Green Army books, uh, in the Army the green books of the US Army, 
which I looked into is, and where they explained the whole system and, and they were different systems from right. how much spare parts they produced at one point. And they complete tanks basically in spare parts in storage, yeah. whereas the Germans were always low, low on, on things. But still, it could still be, even without that, that the Sherman was way more re reliable. Yeah. There are some indications that point to this, but I'm not sure yet. So this is also sometimes the case that you have a whole, whole PhD thesis to answer and to write then two or three lines you would need in, in your video to make a clear statement. And I say usually, I don't know, or I leave this fact out for that and that reason. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why the comparison video that I've made is like 30 something minutes long, uh, because you have to talk through a lot of things. Yeah. And even then you have to qualify and say, there are certain things I cannot look at. Yeah. And I have other comparison videos sort of in the background. I have two scripts still, WIP, you know, work in progress, uh, where I'm just like, how am I going to compare these things? Because there are popular matchups, you know, let's say B of 109 against the Spitfire. Yeah. But there's so much you know, predefined opinions on this where it's like, oh, you know, one was on the winning side of the Battle of Britain, so it must have been better. Well, what kind of metric is that? Well, well, yeah, and, and then so you sometimes you see videos, I don't know, um, comparing the Harrier, for example, now with the F-35. Okay, hard stats, comparison, cool. Yeah, what does that tell us about anything? Yeah, so... I mean, for, for instance, the, the 109 versus the Spitfire, you, yeah. you compared it in the, in the context of the Battle of Britain, yeah. where the 109 had to fly already over the channel, exactly. so that they have, which has certain problems. Yeah. Well, mainly, mainly it's with range, but then also uh, the Spitfire have early warning with yeah. the radar, they know where to go. Um, so that we would yeah. do, but I usually do a, a general comparison where I look at the technical ta uh, data. Yeah? Yeah. For instance, what's usually done with, if, with all tank comparisons is that they show the tank and at which range the other tank could kill the other tank. I usually don't do that. I, I didn't do this at all so far because I look which tank in general was better in what category. And this is like, I don't do it direct tank versus tank combat mm -hmm. because that usually don't happen in any way because the fight information yeah. is yeah. like you have the same with planes. Yeah. But I look at the technical, tactical, what are the good if you take them, if you want to choose one tank on your own. This is similar like Saloga did. He took the tanker's choice. So what one tank commander would choose. And then I think he took the, the commander's choice, mm. which a company commander would choose as a tank and different ones. Can be very different. So, so there's also a, a different aspect where I look at this. But I generally just look more on the basic stats and technical, uh, technical issues. And for the T-34 versus Panzer III, I then qualified that on the strategic level, the, I, the T-34 was probably better because it was more focused on mass production and other elements. Mm -hmm. Because they actually knew that the T-34 had many problems and they wanted to build the T-34M, but then the Germans attacked. So they said, okay, um, let's don't improve now. Let's do minor improvements yeah. or these very important improvements, but the other, I don't know, 50 or 100 or 1000 yeah. improvements, we, we don't have time to this. We, we need to out. pull yeah. out, uh, put out tanks. That's yeah. the, the other thing, just as a roundup here. Uh, why did the Italians put free aircraft into production and they knew in comparison flights that one might actually be superior than all the others? The reason why they did it is because all the tooling, all the infrastructure in the industry was already ready for these aircraft. And then they knew if they have to have two out of three factories essentially retooling them to make the third aircraft that the third factory is already producing, that's going to take way long more time on the short term to pump out the same amount of aircraft. So let's put all aircraft into production and put it out there. So coming from it from a comparison point standpoint and saying, well, one was clearly superior than the other, why didn't they just focus on that? Completely ignores the economic and the sort of the reality because they needed a lot of planes very, very fast. Same thing with the Soviet Union, lag free. Yeah, it's not that great of an aircraft. It still held its own in a certain aspects um, because every plane can do something at least better yeah. than another airplane. But what it was important is pumping out aircraft and getting aircraft in the sky and being in opposition and fielding an opposition because you do not you know, want to give air superiority to the enemy for free at least. Anyway, I think we've chewed through this nicely. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, I mean, there's been many questions that sort of influenced this talk. 
um, you know, we're, we do enjoy reading through your uh, questions and uh, sort of having a talk about these things. Thank you very much for all Patreon supporters, uh, channel members, subscribe star of both our channels. You keep the lights on. Thank you very much. If you want to support our channels, please check out those avenues as well or share our videos. And as always, thank you very much, Bernard, for being here. Thank you for having me. And have a great day. Good hunting and see you in the sky. See you next time. Bye.